question. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Well, thanks, Maya and the organizers for having all of us here. And uh, it's a lot of work to organize a school for 100 students, so make sure to thank the organizers um, profusely when you come across them. So the topic of, the, of today's lecture is going to be um, topological semi-metals. Topological semi-metals. So um, in David's lectures, good, it's working. So in David's lectures, he told us about a few topological invariants, well, notably the churn number. And that invariant is only well-defined for insulators. Uh, the reason is because the Berry phase requires this smooth evolution of states. And so whenever you have a band touching point, the Berry phase will become ill-defined. But we know that we have notions of topological semimetals, most importantly, the vial semimetal. So how can we apply notions of topological invariance to semimetals? That's the question that I want to answer today. And the basic answer to that question is that what we should do if we have a semi-metal is find a subdimensional manifold which is gapped, and that might be the Fermi surface. And so if we find a gapped manifold um, in our Bruin zone, then we can apply the notions of topological invariance that apply to insulators to semi-metals. So that's the point that I want to uh, convey today. I think that there's many good references, but the two references that I wanted to mention are, um, so David's textbook, is a very good reference, um, not just on berry phases, but also on many electronic structure applications. Um, that includes vial semi-metals. And then there's also a great review of modern physics by Armitage, Millet, and, and Vishwanath, which is specifically on the topic of Dirac and vial semi-metals. Okay, so um, so most of what we're going to talk about will be vial semi-metals. So I want to try to start from the beginning for this. So the, uh, and let me also say, I think if you have short questions, you should feel free to interrupt, just raise your hand. Um, and if you have a more involved question, then we can chat during the coffee break. So the canonical form for a vial Hamiltonian would be H equals V K dot sigma, where the sigmas are the poly matrices and the and the Ks are the um are the are the wave vectors. And so of course this gives us a linear dispersion. And the Fermi surface, so there'll be some Fermi level, say somewhere up here. And so the Fermi surface will be a sphere. I can only draw two of that here, so that looks like a circle. Um, but the Fermi surface is a sphere, and it will satisfy V squared, K squared, equals EF squared. So in particular, along this Fermi surface, the Fermi surface is gapped. So since the Fermi surface is not exactly at the vial point, then there's some gap like this, which we could say would be the gap on the Fermi surface. So the Fermi surface is a gapped manifold generically, and in addition to that, it's also a 2D manifold because it will be a sphere. And so now we can apply the formalism, for example, that David was just discussing. This is a gap 2D manifold, so we can compute its churn number. And so in that way, we can apply the notion of a topological invariant to a semi-metal. Um, and so we can actually do this explicitly. And so the formula that we want to use, we can say that the Chern number is 1 over 2 pi times the integral of the Berry curvature. So this is Berry curvature. And this ds would be the normal vector to the Fermi surface. And this integral would be over the Fermi surface. So we can actually compute this thing explicitly, and that gives us a way to define the churn number of a particular vial point. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that when I write a Hamiltonian um, like this one, 
it's a continuum Hamiltonian. That means I have some band structure. It has lots and lots of bands, but I see a band crossing somewhere. And I look at that band crossing and I expand around it. So this is just a two by two matrix capturing a particular part of the band structure, which is say, you know, localized around some particular K naught. And as we know, vial fermions have to come in pairs. So at minus K naught, maybe there'll be another vial fermion, which will have a similar dispersion. Ah, so what I mean is that because the Fermi surface, if as long as the Fermi level is not exactly at the vial point, then there's this energy gap, like the, the fir part of the Fermi surface will be, for example, this point right here. So there, at that particular point, there's a gap between the valence band and the conduction band. So on the entire Fermi surface, there's not, there, there's a gap between, like the band touching point is down here, but on the Fermi surface, as long as the Fermi level is not at zero here, then there's going to gap, be a gap between the conduction band and the valence band. So this picture is energy versus K. But if I think in K space, I could say my vial point is at one point. The Fermi surface is a sphere around that point. And on that sphere, there's a gap between the conduction and valence bands. Only at zero energy is there not a gap between those bands. Yeah? From transfer, I had the same Oh, there's another Fermi surface at another vial point. So there'll be, yeah. Yeah, so what I, I guess what I mean is that, yeah, there's a, there's a conduction band and a valence band. At this energy, I could say that there's a conduction band up here and there's a valence band down here. Um, so on that manifold, there's an energy gap between conduction. The, the manifold, the Fermi surface is not all of 3D space. It's a 2D sub-manifold. And if I made this plot for only that manifold, then I would see that there's an energy gap. Actually, let me keep going. Did you want to say something to clarify? I, know where the, the, I think I know where the question is coming from, because you can certainly you know, make excitations across the Fermi surface, big gauntlets. But what, what's happening here is that you view that Hamiltonian is just two-level system. Exactly. Yeah. So, so maybe this will help. So in other words, I can write down these eigenstates. I can write down plus eigenstates and minus eigenstates, which will be for the upper band and the lower band. And there's a gap between these eigenstates as long as I'm on the Fermi surface. OK. Yeah, so there's gapless excitations. But um, but nonetheless, I can on the Fermi surface, there's an upper band and there's a lower band, and they don't touch each other in energy. So what I, what I actually, this is actually what I want to write down. So from this Hamiltonian, it's two by two matrix, so we can diagonalize it exactly. And so we can write down the energy eigenstates for the lower band and the upper band. Um, I'll just write these down. So theta and phi are the, uh, are the spherical coordinates of the K vector. So we have an upper band and a lower band. So you can check for yourself that these are exact eigenstates. Um, and right, so these eigenstates touch at one point. Everywhere away from that point, they don't touch and they're separated by an energy gap. That's what I mean by gapped. And so once we have these eigenstates in hand, then we can explicitly compute the Berry curvature and the Berry connection. And from that, we can get the churn number. And so these are the exact formulas that David wrote down, but I'm just going to write them in spherical coordinates. So the Berry connection A is a vector, so it has three components. And instead of writing that as Kx, Ky, and Kz components, we can write it as a radial component, um, a theta component, and a phi component. So we can write the radial component, for example, as minus i dr on u plus. This thing is zero because our wave functions have no r dependence. So that's straightforwardly zero. The theta component, now we have to, instead of just writing minus i d theta, we have to write this in spherical components. So it's uh, minus i over r d d theta on u plus. 
you can go through the steps that actually compute this, but this one also comes out to be zero. So the only component that comes out to be not zero with this basis choice is the phi component. Um, so similarly, we need to write this in spherical co coordinates. So we get minus i over r sine theta d d phi on u plus. And if you go through and take the phi derivative of this state, then you see that for the u plus state, the phi derivative um, only gives us the the only the upper component, not the lower component, has phi dependence. Um, so if you track everything through, I won't actually take the derivatives, but this is what you actually get. Minus cos squared theta over 2 over r sine theta. So from the Berry connection, you can compute the Berry curvature. And because we're using this formula for churn number, which is that we want to only find the Berry curvature on the Fermi surface, this normal vector part is always pointing outwards on the Fermi surface. So we only need to find the radial component of the Berry curvature. And so the Berry curvature is the curl of the Berry connection. And so if I write that out in spherical coordinates, I get the following. So 1 over r sine theta d d theta of the phi part of the Berry connection, and then d d phi of the theta part. The theta part was zero. Um, we already computed it, but the phi part is not zero. So then it's just straightforwardly a matter of taking all these derivatives, and you get this to be um, 1 over 2 r squared. And so finally, we can plug this in to get our churn number. So remember the formula that we had for churn number. This is 1 over 2 pi integral over Fermi surface of Berry curvature on the Fermi surface with dotted with the normal vector. So that just gives us the radial part of the Berry curvature. So we have 1 over 2 pi. The angular part of this integral, there's no angular dependence because this 1 over 2 r squared has no angular dependence. So we get a factor of 4 pi coming from the angular part of the integral. And then our integral is the Berry curvature, 1 over 2 r squared. Since it's a spherical integral, we have an r squared dr. So these factors all cancel each other. We just get a factor of 1 over 2. And so when we put all this together, we have 1 over 2 pi times 4 pi times a half. So that gives us 1. So this is the... Hmm? It's, it's, not, it's not a radial integral. It's a, it's a radial integral, but it's on the Fermi surface. So the angular part gave us this 4 pi. Yeah, thanks. So the angular part gave us the 4 pi. That's from the d phi and the d theta. The radial part is what's giving us the r squared dr, but the Fermi surface is only at one slice of the radial part. So that just gives us a factor of 1. So this gives us a churn number of 1 for this vial fermion. So going back, going back to our little sketch here, this means that if our Fermi level is positive, we, we took all these derivatives for this... Uh, this u plus eigenstate. I was assuming that the Fermi level was greater than zero. And that's when we came up with this churn number of one. If the Fermi level was less than zero, I could have followed all the same steps for the u minus eigenstate, and I would have gotten a minus one. So what we find is that the churn number of a vial fermion, this particular vial fermion, would be one if the Fermi level is greater than zero, and we would have found, but we didn't actually check it, that it would be minus 1 if the Fermi level is less than 0. And if the Fermi level is exactly at 0, then we run into this situation where we have a band touching and we can't define the churn number anymore. So this is the sense in which for a semi-metal like a vial fermion, we can give it a topological invariant. Depending on where the Fermi level is, we can compute the churn number of the Fermi surface. There's an energy gap separating the conduction and valence bands on the Fermi surface. Um, and right, and then we can define we can define a, a topological invariant. And there's consequences of this. Question? Like the DN vector has a so you should think of this, uh, there's a few different ways that you can write it. You could think of this as, this is a 3D integral, but I only want to pick out the Fermi surface. So I could have really, maybe I should have written this as like delta of R equals KF. Does that make sense? 
So it's a 3D integral where I can write r squared sine theta d theta d phi dr, but then it's only on the Fermi surface. So, so I want to write this delta function. Any other questions? Okay, so um, I think David kind of already said this, but there's actually a pretty nice general result. So there's a general result um, from Barry's, from one of, his, one of his papers, which happens to be his 1984 paper, um, where uh, you can write a Hamiltonian, which looks like you could think of it as a spin in a magnetic field. You can write a Hamiltonian like this. Um, you could think of this as a spin in a magnetic field, but in our case, it's just our vial fermion, which was k dot sigma. But we could generalize this, where the spins s, instead of being the spin half poly matrices, could be any spin, spin one, spin two, any spin. You could write a Hamiltonian like this. The eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian, you can think of this as going in the z basis. So the eigenvalues will always be h bar v k times SZ, where SZ takes on integer values, minus S, minus S plus one, plus S. If you're in this situation, then the radial component of Berry curvature, when the Fermi level is in the SZ band, will be SZ over R squared. And if you follow through the steps that we just did, that gives you a churn number of two SZ. So for our vial fermion case, then this means we get a plus or minus one, because we use spin half. So SZ could be plus half or minus half, and that means we get churn number of plus one or minus one, depending on where our Fermi level is. But more generally, we could write down a Hamiltonian where S is, say, a spin one matrix, and then that would tell us that these SZ values go from minus one to plus one, and then the churn number would be minus two or plus two. So this is something that we can come back to, which will be relevant if we talk about um, multifold fermions. But the, the vial case also fits into this paradigm. Okay, so what are the consequences of having this topological invariant? So one consequence is that this tells us that the vial point is topologically protected. So no small perturbation can gap a vial fermion. If you tried to open a gap, then what would happen is that, so how would I say it like this? Suppose that you could open up a gap, then your Fermi surface would be able to be continuously shrunk down to zero, and then you couldn't define a churn number on your Fermi surface, it would have to be zero. But we know that the churn number is plus or minus one, we just showed it. And so therefore you reach a contradiction, so it can't be that you can open up a gap on the Fermi surface. So file points are protected purely by topology. They don't require any symmetry for their protection. If you have two vial points that have opposite chirality, then of course their net churn number is zero. So if you bring them close to each other, then you can open up a gap. And that's the only way that you can open up a gap. Okay, good. And then the other um, kind of corollary to this is that no small, oh, question? Yeah, sorry, I got a little bit confused. Yeah. Um, this, uh, we have like our uh, minimal uh, guess and we still say like, oh, okay, but we have our cones and 1.8 assumption. So, like, <laughs> we then look at the, 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 um, I, now I'm just saying like, okay, there's no, no perturbation that can guess with what you're Yeah. So, I'm just confused. Yeah, yeah, so I'm saying you might think, could I add a mass term to this? Could I, could, you might think my Hamiltonian is VK dot sigma. Could I add some other term to be determined that would make this be an insulator? Is there any term that I could add? Like you might think, well, why don't I try adding something like something? This is a generic thing. This doesn't open up a gap. What this does is it moves the vial point around. So I can compute this spectrum if I add a perturbation like this. Um, and it just shifts your vial point to a different K point, but it doesn't actually open up a gap. Yeah, so then I'm, again, now we have like two different churn numbers for Fermi, 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 Fermi,
Mm-hmm. Smaller than. Yeah. Uh, smaller than zero. And um, I you get to Okay, yeah, so, so the point would be, let me just say something more about this. This is, our Hamiltonian is a two by two matrix. Any perturbation I try to write down must also be a two by two matrix. So suppose I tried to add a mass term like this. I can see this would basically just be, so I have kx sigma x plus ky sigma y. This would be kz plus m sigma z. This would just shift the z the z component of my vial point. So I can move my vial point around, but I can never actually split it to be insulating. The only way that I can do that is if I have two vial points, which are something like this, and if they're actually kind of connected in this way, and if they have opposite churn numbers, then I could bring them close enough that they could annihilate each other and then become an insulator. Yeah. Is this uh, homological protection strictly um, limited to perturbation? For example, it, it's limited to perturb. Ah, sorry, maybe I should let you finish. Yeah. So if, it, if, a, if a strong circulatory uh, like light is present, uh, then this, this breaks under the symmetry. Yeah. So it's limited to perturbation in the sense that, in like in this lower case, if I had a plus and a, vi a plus and a minus file, then I could um, I could bring them closer and closer together. So basically, they would eventually be touching, and then they could annihilate like this. So that's what I meant by limited to perturbation. I, what I consider non-perturbative is big enough that two vials touch each other. If you similarly, if you have any any other probe that you do, which is just probing one vial fermion, won't be able to open up a gap. But if you're perturbing your band structure big enough to couple vial fermions of opposite chirality. That's the only way to open a gap. Yeah. Okay, good. What this also means is that by perturbations, I could also consider something anisotropic. I could consider taking my vial cone and tilting it. I could consider having different velocities in the X and Y direction. So actually, the um, the Hamiltonian that I wrote down is not completely general. It's just the easiest one um, that I can diagonalize in my head. But actually, we can write down the most general um, K, linear in K Hamiltonian, um, which is the following. So I could say there actually might be some there might be some linear term with the identity matrix sigma naught. And in general, I could write this as uh, a sum over, this is, this is the most general formulation. This is just saying, suppose I have some Hamiltonian that I want to expand around K naught to linear order. In general, for every poly matrix, I might have some linear K part with some coefficient determined by this tensor. This is just the only way that I can write down a linear order expansion. I could still compute the churn number of this vial point. It would be tilted, it would be anisotropic, but it still has a well-defined churn number we usually call this the chirality, and this chirality is given by the sign of the determinant of this matrix A. So for the original Hamiltonian that I wrote down up here, k dot sigma, this matrix A is just the identity matrix. Its determinant is 1, and the churn number is 1, so we'll say that has a chirality of plus 1. If I make small perturbations to that, what will happen is that this chi is clearly only an integer, so a small perturbation can't change the value of that integer. And I need to do something quite drastic in order to change the chirality. So I just want to point out that this is the most general form of a vial fermion, and we can define its chirality in this way, even if it doesn't take this kind of more simple equation that we computed explicitly. OK, good. The, the other consequence of the topology, I think this is kind of one of the major consequences, is surface Fermi arcs. So um, what we've basically, sh oh, yes, question. Sorry, question for you both. Uh, so this topological protection only for the two-level pipe, or does it extend to the, like, the pipe stigma? Uh, like the highest Oh. Great question. Yeah, so the higher spin vial also has a churn number, so it has the exact same level of topological protection. 
Yeah, so actually let me say it like this. So the higher spin vial in a crystal, so here's what you can do. The higher spin vial point, um, it has a churn number, but you could split it. If you have a churn number of two, you could split into two churn ones. Yeah, so the, the topology is protecting only the churn number, but a churn number two is the same as one plus one, so you can split it in that way. It's the crystal symmetry combined with the topology that keeps it as one band touching point. Yeah, great, great question. Yes? A clarifying comment, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. You know, at the surface of a topological insulator, you have a direct cone. It's basically a vial cone, but in two dimensions. So we don't call it a vial cone, we call it a direct cone. But those are one-dimensional things. And because it's in two dimensions, you can open the gap with the perturbation. But in three dimensions, you can't. So I just wanted to make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So the vial fermions that I'm talking about are in 3D, and we're using all three poly matrices. You could contrast that with the surface of a topological insulator, which you would also write as a Dirac cone k dot sigma. So you would think, why is this any different? It's written exactly the same, but it's implied that this is only kx sigma x and ky sigma y because it's on a 2D surface. There is no kz. That case requires time reversal symmetry for its protection because in that case, you could add precisely this sigma z mass term and it would open a gap. So there is a very big difference between Dirac cones on the surface of a topological insulator, which are protected by time reversal, and vial points, which are like a 3D Dirac cone in the bulk of a 3D material that don't require any symmetry protection. Yeah? I think that may have evoked more questions than... So in the back, and then here, then Maya. Yeah? Yeah, so this is, this is precisely the point. So in 3D, you have a vial point. It's one point in your 3D Bruin zone. The Fermi surface is a 2D sphere. And on the Fermi surface, there's no band degeneracy. There's no band touchings. So that's what I meant by a 2D gapped Fermi surface. Um, and then you can compute the churn number of that Fermi surface because, precisely because it's 2D and precisely because there's no band touching. <laughs> On a 2D system, the Fermi surface is a 1D loop, so you could compute a Berry phase around it. And that's something you could do in graphene, for example. You could compute the Berry phase uh, of that Dirac home, but you couldn't, yeah. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't have the right dimension. Yeah, question in the front, yeah. Yeah, uh, you, so in general, you have some material with a vial some vial point. There has to be another vial of opposite chirality. Those two things don't have to be related by symmetry. So what I was going to say in a moment is if you have time reversal or inversion, then at k and minus k, these vial points will be related to each other. Um, let, let, me, let me just come back to that. Yeah, how about I come back to it? Yeah. Maya, still? Yeah. Yeah, you have a system that has a line with just, you know, recovery. Mm. Uh-huh. So if you have a vial without spin orbit coupling, then I would think of that as having um, two vial points, one for a spin, one for one spin, one for the other spin. Those have the same churn number, so those ones can't gap. But if you have a something different, like a Dirac point, which um, has a spin degeneracy, then the Dirac point could gap. Yeah, I'm going to say more about Dirac's. But yeah, if you have a spinless system with a vial point and you add spin orbit coupling, you can't open the gap because you still have the churn number. It's like a, it's a, be a churn number of one for one spin and one for the other spin. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great question. So you still, as long as you only have the one vial point there is still no way to open up the gap with higher order terms in the Hamiltonian. And the reason is because the higher order terms will still be K-dependent. And so to op the gap is at our, what we're calling K equals zero in this basis. And so as you get closer and closer to that point, then your higher order terms will vanish because it'll be like a K squared, a K cubed. All those points will vanish as you get closer to K.
But if your higher order terms give you the two vial points, then you can make them annihilate. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Right, because it's only the Fermi surface, yeah. Okay, good. Um, great, so the other, so that's kind of, what are the consequences of having a topological invariant? One is that the vial point can't gap. The other is that you have surface Fermi arcs. And so one way that I can understand this is that what we've been talking about is we've been saying we have some vial point at some K naught. And it has a Fermi surface, which is a sphere. Um, and this sphere has a churn number. Say churn number equals one. So I can think about deforming this sphere. I can think about, now I'm just taking some any curve in K-space that encloses the vial point. Say it's not the Fermi surface, but it's just some, some, other, some other shape. And I can keep deforming the sphere to make it more and more oblong until it breaks. And so I could kind of break it so I have just a plane on one side and a plane on the other side of my vial point. And it must be that the churn number combined of these two planes on either side of the vial point has to be one, the difference in churn number. So I can say this is a plane on one side of the vial point, this is a plane on the other side of the vial point. And so we have that the difference in churn number between these two planes must be one. Because if I push them close together, I can kind of deform them to make a circle around the, um, around the vial point, and that circle has a churn number of one. And so there's an alternative way of thinking about the topology of vial points, which is to think whenever I have a vial point at some k naught, I can compute the churn number of planes on either side. and say this plane will have a churn number of plus one, and this plane will have a churn number of zero. In other words, I can think I have a 3D Bruin zone, and I can think about taking slices of it. Each 2D slice is a plane. And as long as my 2D slice has a gap between the conduction and valence bands, I can compute its churn number. So I have a bunch of planes on one side, and I compute their churn number, and I have a churn number of one. And as I keep moving around, as long as I'm on one side, then the Hamiltonian is slowly changing in k-space. So whatever churn number I have doesn't change. So all these planes on one side have a churn number of one. When I hit the vial point, it's basically saying that my conduction and valence bands close, and now when they reopen, the churn number has jumped to zero. And you know for the churn number to change, a gap has to close, and that gap closing is precisely the vial point. So this is like an alternative perspective. You can think of a vial point as a critical point between planes which have different churn number. The usefulness of this perspective is that we know that a plane with churn number one has the edge states that David was just talking about. So for the planes that have a churn number of one, we can think that they have some, um, some occupied valence bands, they have some conduction bands, but they always need to have also this extra surface state. Precisely where the Fermi level crosses that surface state, that gives you one point in your Fermi arc. And if you went to the next plane, just slightly shifted in K, then you would also have a churn number one, you would also have a surface state, and that would also contribute to your Fermi arc. So for all of these different planes between some vial point at K naught and say its partner at minus K naught, all of these different planes have a churn number, they all contribute a surface state, and so that's what gives you this surface Fermi arc, which starts at the projection of one vial and ends at the projection of another vial point. So I think that the, the planes represent, I have a 3D K space and my vial point is at one point. So I can consider a, a plane in my 3D space, which is next to that point. And since as long as I don't enclose that point, that plane has an energy gap. So I can compute the churn number of, um, say, I do it of the occupied bands. It'll have a churn number of, say, one. When I jump across the vial point, the churn number always changes by one. It either goes from one to zero or goes from zero to minus one. It always changes by one. So what I'm basically saying is we have a 3D system, but I can consider that to be a bunch of 2D systems which are uh, parameterized by the remaining K-coordinate. And those 2D systems can have a churn number 
and that chern number jumps by one when I cross a vial point. And that's a different way of understanding the topology of the vial point. Ah, uh, so, right, so, so, if I have, right, if the entire Earth is made of this one crystal, then I can never see the surface states because it doesn't have a surface. But you're saying, so yeah, so let me draw an, another sketch. Um, I think the right sketch to make would basically be, uh, so I'll have like KX, well, KX, KY, and real space Z. So you want a crystal which is terminated in the Z direction, but it has, but I can draw the vial points in the KX and the KY directions. Yeah, so I have some vial point here and some other vial point. It doesn't have to be at minus K0, but let's just say that it is. Okay, I can consider these intermediate planes, say. This plane in between them might have a churn number. This plane on the other side of this vial point has vanishing churn number, something like that. Each of these intermediate planes, um, each of these intermediate planes, which has a churn number, will consider a surface state where your crystal meets the vacuum. Will have a surface state where your crystal meets the vacuum, and so this plane has a churn um, has a surface state. The plane next to it has a surface state. The plane next to it has a surface state, and so when you project these vial points onto the surface, you end up with this surface Fermi arc, where one point has come from each individual plane having a churn number. Does that, that answers your question, I think. Yeah. Dima, you don't like this picture? No, no, no. So in an honest two-dimensional event structure, the mm. turn number uh, is, is integer, right? But here you're just taking some arbitrary slice. Yeah. Can you have three up and one up, or you still want No, All right, because you still, you can really consider this slice to be a 2D, it has all the properties of a 2D system. But if you, if you don't, don't, don't go to particular some crystallographic direction, but just take some weird... Any... Is, is it easy to see why, why that? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, as long as you're... So you have to choose a plane. It can, it can be a generic plane. It doesn't, doesn't have to be, you know, Cartesian or something. But it needs to be complete in the sense that your, your plane has periodic boundary conditions. So... You know, it's not necessarily KX, KY, it's K1, K2, but your plane better still ha be periodic. Right, but then our arbitrary plane in, in momentum space will not <coughs> An arbitrary, yeah, I can still take a slice and it will still be periodic. Anyways, thank you. Yeah, so you need a slice with periodic boundary conditions. <laughs> It needs to be a slice perpendicular to some reciprocal lattice vector. Yeah, that, that's what I suspected. That, that, that is the condition, actually, right? Yeah. Okay, but you have many different choices of reciprocal lattice vectors, which don't... So if my reciprocal lattice vectors are x and y, then I also have, like, x plus 2y. I could also choose this. You know, I can make bigger and bigger reciprocal lattice vectors. Yeah. Yeah, so... Numbers that are, like, Yeah, I'm aware of those numbers. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it needs to have periodic boundary conditions. That's the slice, but it can be at an angle or something. Yeah. But it could be curved. It could be any plane, right? It doesn't, it could, all, it could also be curved. You know, I mean, our Fermi surface was a sphere to start with. So you need a closed, so here's the thing. It can be a closed 2D manifold. Then there's no constraint. Any shape whatsoever that encloses your vial point will have a churn number. Or... Now, if you make a plane, it's a little bit, you know, what makes it closed? It better have periodic boundary conditions. So it needs, it, it could go from KX, you know, or KY, and that's what makes it closed. Um, right. So, yeah, that, that's the thing. You need to have periodic boundary conditions so that you can close it in some way. Okay, good. The, the other consequence of having topology of a vial, of the topology of the vial point is transport consequences. And so... Um, one of these consequences will be the chiral anomaly, which I think will probably probably be talked about in some later lectures. And the other, so so A, 
chiral anomaly, um, which means that basically because you always have a plus file point and a minus file point, and they're actually always connected by bands deep below the Fermi surface, if you apply a field, then you can pump electrons from one to the other. So there's not a conservation of electrons at each. The other consequence, the other transport cons consequence, is that you have anomalous hall. And so the anomalous hall is precisely coming from these planes. If you have these planes that have a churn number, then as David showed before, you have a sigma xy, a hall conductivity, which is coming from that churn number. And so each of the planes with a churn number will contribute to the hall conductivity. Um, good. Uh, what time is it actually? I don't. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Great. So, so the other thing that I want to say about vial fermions, um, this relates to the earlier question, is what is the role of symmetry? So we already said that vial fermions don't need any symmetry to protect them. So then you might think that um, that there is that we don't need to think about symmetry at all. But in fact, the main role of symmetry is that it relates different vial points to each other. And so the main symmetries that we can consider, well, first off, okay, okay, good. So first off, we have um, inversion symmetry. So inversion symmetry takes k to minus k. So that means suppose we have some vial point at k naught. Suppose we have this vial Hamiltonian that we've been talking about. Inversion symmetry will map us to minus k naught, and it'll take k to minus k, so the Hamiltonian will be v of minus k dot sigma. So from the general formula that I wrote down before for the chirality of a vial point, you can take the sign of the determinant of this matrix, when I switch from k to minus k, I'm basically changing this matrix from identity matrix to minus identity matrix. So if this has a chirality of plus 1, then this has a chirality of minus 1. So whenever you have inversion symmetry, then your vial point at k has a partner at minus k with the opposite chirality. Time reversal symmetry is the other major symmetry to consider. So I can do something similar. I have some vial point at some k naught. It has some Hamiltonian v k dot sigma. The action of time reversal symmetry is that I, so time reversal also takes k to minus k, but um, the Hamiltonian will be v of minus k dot sigma star because time reversal also complex conjugates. And so then um, what you can see is that what the sigma star does, so this is basically uh, sorry, v, v of kx sigma x, sorry, minus kx sigma x. It would be a minus ky, but the sigma y star is minus sigma y. So you get a plus ky sigma y and then minus kz sigma z. So we've only changed two of the signs in this matrix. So changing two signs leaves the determinant the same. So if this has a chirality of plus one, then this has the same chirality of plus one. So time reversal symmetry relates to vial points that have the same chirality. There's an important consequence of this, which is that we know that the, there needs to be the same number of positive and negative vial points in the entire band structure. So if time reversal symmetry tells us that k and minus k both have vial points with plus chirality, there must be two other minuses somewhere. Don't know where they are, but they must be somewhere. So if you have time reversal symmetry, then it must be that you have a minimum of four vial points. You might have more, but you can never have less than four. Yeah? Yeah, so, so I haven't told you what this matrix sigma is right? Um, it could be spin, it could be some other degree of freedom, but uh, if you expand your two by two matrix, so you have some big Hamiltonian with many bands, you have a band crossing. Um, actually, if your band crossing has no degeneracy, then we've kind of already assumed that we have both spin orbit coupling, right? Then we've assumed that we have spin orbit coupling. So we're expanding around these two bands and um, 
the 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 time reversal symmetry will always take k to minus k, and it will always complex conjugate. Uh, yeah, there, I think there's no other way around that. So that can have, right, how should I? This should have the same effect. Um, yeah, how should I think of this? I think it will have the, usually what, what do you have? You have sigma y k. Um, right, it should, it should have the same effect. Maybe I need to think about how the detail works out, but it should have the same effect, yeah. Right. So, if you have, um, that's a that's a good question. If I have a vial fermion at a time reversal invariant point, then what will happen? Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's possible to have that. Probably for the same reason, uh, maybe for the same reason that was just asked about. Yeah, I don't think it's possible if you, in a time reversal invariant system, if you if you have non-degenerate bands, then I don't think you can generically have a vial fermion at a time reversal invariant point. Um, or wait, you can you can have a time reversal invariant violence surrounded by like, like a cage. Yeah, in the for example, it happens that you have like a parabolic band, you have an Yeah, but if you have a parabolic band, then maybe I don't want to call that a single. But at zero, you have a violence. Mm. Ah, so let me say it like this. If I have, suppose I have a vial point at the, at the origin, at the gamma point. We discussed how the churn number needs to jump across that vial point. For the churn number to jump, that means that I can't have time reversal symmetry. So in a time reversal invariant system, I can't have a vial point at a time reversal invariant point. If I don't have time reversal symmetry, then I can have such a vial point. And that must be the system that you're thinking of. But then I can't have a churn number jumping across. Yeah, that's the thing. The, the way out of it is that there's actually no. There's no plane which has. Yeah. Yeah. So, and in, in that case, probably you still have a minimum number. You still have your minimum of four vial points because you have these other vial points around which have this four constraint, probably. Actually, the, yeah. Uh, you could yeah. have a plus and minus point which annihilate at, at, at the time. Well, that could certainly happen. At that critical annihilation, then I don't know how you describe that. Then it's like that's a, a quad. Of yeah, that's a quadra. I would call that quadratic band touching. Yeah, we can come back to it. Yeah, Juan. Uh, sure, call. So that, that's very nice. So that seems to exclude uh, material with only one trap point. Because in the magnetic field, it would split into two wild numbers. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, so, in fact, I don't even know from any material where there's only a single trap point. So there's also a similar type of theorem. There's also a similar result that you can't, that Dirac points must also come in pairs. Um, one way that I could think about that is uh, that I can also consider a Dirac point to have a jump in some invariant. It's not the churn number, but there's a different invariant which it would be. And um, right, so if you tried to have a Dirac point, right, here's, if you, then you have a plane on either side, that plane has a different invariant, but the Brouillard zone is periodic, so then you have that invariant moving to the opposite sides of the Brouillard zone and they don't match up. So that's a diff that's another way of considering that you can't have an isolated one. Yeah. Ah, uh, like nodal lines or or nodal planes. Yeah. So right. So I guess if you have only point-like degeneracies, then that's 
that's where these statements hold strictly. Yes. Can, can you have it to allow notes and then you move them to large then so there will be a single garage work then? That will be quadratic. Yeah. If they merge at the exact point that they touch. Yeah, it won't be linear anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let, let me just say the, the last thing I want to say, which is important, um, which is that since we've seen that um, time reversal relates to, well, maybe I should keep this up. Time reversal relates to vial points that have the same chirality and inversion relates to vial points that have opposite chirality. Then you can see that if you have time reversal and inversion, then vial points are forbidden because you'd have, say, a plus vial. Time reversal would tell you have another plus and then inversion would tell you have a minus at the same point as the plus. So that's the, that's the very important statement, which is that Vial points don't require any symmetry to protect them, but they can be forbidden by symmetry. So time reversal plus inversion forbids having vial fermions. And actually, that's also because it forbids having any Berry curvature. Berry curvature vanishes everywhere. Um, so, so you can never have a churn number. If you, if you have rotation symmetry, then rotation symmetry um, doesn't change the determinant of that matrix A. So that would relate different vial points that have the same chirality. It would just say, oh, I have one vial point here. Now I rotate my crystal. I must have another one here. Those would all have the same chirality. So rotation symmetry relates vials of same chirality. And then if you have a symmetry like mirror um, uh, or roto inversion, anything which is combined with an inversion symmetry, then these things relate vial points of opposite chirality. I have a question. Yes. But let's say you have a time reversal or inversion symmetry. Or. Mm -hmm. But you have PT symmetry. Mm, you don't have either, but you have the combined. You're saying, yeah, yeah. So if you don't have either, but you have the combined, then you also can't have a vial point because the combined, the combined is what forbids having any buried curvature. Yeah. So basically, not having, not having buried curvature is more fundamental than the, the symmetry itself. Symmetry is what prevents you from having buried curvature. So. Yeah, maybe it's a chicken egg situation. Yes, if you have vanishing berry curvature in any system, then you can't have a vial fermion um, because we wrote down a model for a vial fermion and it had berry curvature. Yeah, but usually you generically will have some berry curvature and symmetry is what forbids it, and that symmetry would be the TI product. Yeah. Okay, so I think this is a good stopping point for vial fermions, and maybe next time we can talk about. Um, if you do have symmetries, what are the other types of semi-metals that you can have? But are there, so are there any other questions? Yeah. No, it's great. It will be. Yes. It's very hard for me to draw a good picture. Yeah. Okay. So on each of these planes, am I expanding my Hamiltonian? So your Hamiltonian will be complicated. So I have this VK dot sigma Hamiltonian, right? So that Hamiltonian is expanding around one point K naught. If I move to K naught plus a little bit, then I still, that same Hamiltonian is still valid. And we computed the churn number there. So I know that there's a churn number of say one. If I move a little bit more, the churn number can't change because no gap has closed. So I have the same churn number. I move a little more, I have the same churn number. As I keep moving my Hamiltonian, there'll be more terms, K squared terms, K cubed terms, um, so it's maybe not the same linear Hamiltonian that I started with, but the churn number still can't change because it can only change if the gap closes. So no matter what perturbations I keep adding to make that K dot T Hamiltonian be valid further and further away, the churn number will never change as long as the gap doesn't close. When it will finally change is when I reach the other file for me on, that's another gap closing. Yeah. How do I actually get the arc? Yes. So... Yeah, so each one of these planes has a churn number. I'm gonna, so one of these intermediate planes, it has a churn number. 
we can draw the same picture that David drew for a churn plane. So E versus some K. So it's a plane, so it's 2D. If I have a surface, now I that means that I don't have K in that direction anymore. I have a real coordinate. So I only have one K left. So I plot E versus K. And I have some valence bands. I have some conduction bands. And I have this surface state, okay? Edge, edge state. I have a Fermi level. The Fermi level crosses that surface state once. So that gives me one state, which is part of my Fermi surface, on the, my surface Fermi surface. The next plane over gives me another state on my surface Fermi surface. So these top and bottom bands, they're coming from one of these. This looks like the upper and lower yeah. of my expansion. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, exactly. So these are precisely the, in my VK dot sigma, it has two bands. There's a lower band and an upper band. That's precisely these conduction and valence bands. But when I make a finite size crystal, I'll get a surface state. That's what this surface state is. Yeah, and that contributes one point to my Fermi arc. Because remember what the, the surface Fermi arc is? It's a collection of points on the surface that are at one energy. So so when we draw a picture, when we draw a picture like um, like this one, we're drawing it as a function of energy. But the Fermi surface, the Fermi level, only crosses one point on that surface state. So to make a Fermi arc, I need to connect many of these different, um, many of these different surface states, and that happens because I have all these different intermediate churn bands. So each one will just contribute, like, um, they'll each contribute one point, which is corresponding to this point, and the next plane over contributes another point, and then all together I end up getting this this arc. Yeah. Mm. Time reversal and inversion symmetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just that combination of symmetries. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't say as I move through the arc, I have the same churn number. I would say that each one of these, um, each one of these kind of intermediate planes, which is between the one vial point and the other vial point, those all have the same churn number. Basically, I have two vial points where the conduction of valence bands touch each other, and in between, I have bands which are gapped. And since the gap doesn't close as I move in between, the churn number can't change as I move on these intermediate planes. Yeah. 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 So, so what happens? What the what that opposite sign means is that when I hit the when I hit the other vial point, the churn number will jump back to zero. That's what it means. So when I cross the first, I go from zero to one. I have a bunch of planes with one. I hit the second, I jump from one to zero. I have a bunch of planes with zero. My opposite sides of the Bruin zone both have churn zero, which is good because the Bruin zone is periodic. Okay. Maybe. Time for any one last pressing question. Yeah. Can we see this uh, crossing of turn number in the public in the experiment? Uh, cro I don't know if you can see the crossing, the jump of turn number, but what you can see is that each one of these um, planes gives you a turn number. So the anomalous hall that you would expect from this 3D crystal will be proportional to the distance between the vial points in momentum space, the momentum space difference. Does that make sense? So the, the number of planes that you have is proportional to that distance. The thing that's very misleading about me saying that is that most crystals that are have vial points have many vial points in many different directions. So actually, um, you know, what I'm saying is really the simplest case with inversion symmetry. If I have time reversal and I have these four vial points, then there's always going to be enough churn bands with opposite churn number that they'll cancel each other. But in principle, if you had an inversion symmetric vial material, then um, and you only had two vial fermions, then in principle you could measure an anomalous Hall conductance oriented the right way, and the magnitude of that would be proportional to the distance and momentum space between the two vial points. Okay. Yes.
Right. So in this example, um, you'd want your, yeah. So in this example, basically the Fermi level is assumed to be exactly at the vial point. And if your Fermi level is a little bit away, then the number of planes that can contribute to anomalous hall is kind of shrunk a little bit because your Fermi surface is, um, is in like, a, is in, your Fermi surface is bigger, so the planes between the vials is smaller, if you want to think of it that way. So, um, right, so let me say it like this. Uh, the, the band structure is the band structure. It doesn't matter where the Fermi level is. I can define a churn number, um, which will be for the, a churn number on the Fermi surface. The churn number of the Fermi surface depends on where the Fermi surface is, because my Fermi surface might um, is is different depending on where it is. It could it shrinks to zero, it gets bigger and bigger. Uh, so if I want to define a churn number of the Fermi surface, then I need to know where the Fermi surface is, and I need to know the Fermi level. On the other hand, the alternate perspective is that I forget about the Fermi level. I have a band structure. My band structure has two vial points. And I can consider planes intermediate to those vial points. And for each plane, I can compute the churn number of that plane. That doesn't care where the Fermi level is. I'm, yeah. Uh, does the role of the symmetry of the surface and of surface termination play any role in how the appearance of or how these Fermi arcs look like? Um, great question. So, yes. The Fermi, the shape of the Fermi arc is, first of all, it's constrained by symmetry. So, for example, if I have some rotation symmetries, then my Fermi arcs better obey those rotation symmetries. Then, if I choose different planes to terminate my crystal, then I'll have different symmetries. So, even from that perspective, it's clear that the Fermi arcs might change shape. Um, suppose I have the simple case where my I only have two vial fermions. If I look at the surface that has them project onto each other, then I won't even see a Fermi arc. So the length of the Fermi arc will depend very much on which surface you choose because its, its endpoints are determined by the projection of the vials onto the surface. In addition, I could change the surface physics and change the shape of the Fermi arc, which is just to say that in, um, in, in these kind of plots, this, this surface state doesn't have to be a straight line. It can have different curvature. Um, so the surface physics actually is what determines strictly the shape of the Fermi arc. Its endpoints are fixed by the topology because it ends on the projections of the vial points. I remember that the confining potential mm -hmm. that gets close to the surface actually determines how, how your arc winds around the, around the projection of one point. So they, they don't really go it straight, they just do it. Yes, there's absolutely, yes. This is the most, the simplest possible picture. Um, so, the integral of this very curvature, um, that does not depend on the kind of manifold we are taking, as long as the gap is not closing on that. Mm -hmm. so it didn't have to be the Fermi surface, even, yeah. So, if we have two wild points, and we do this integral over a sphere, that will be equal to, uh, like, if these two points are inside a torus. Ah, right. mm, uh, I'm sorry. If you, if I take a sphere containing both vial points, then that churn number will be zero. Yeah, and similarly, if we take a torus, which has the two mm -hmm. vial points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the Bruin zone, like the full Bruin zone, for example. Yeah. Okay. Let's end here, but I'm happy to take more questions over coffee. <laughs>